Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week, I had a very special shop visitor that I want to share with you. Keith Rucker from the well-known YouTube machinist channel, VintageMachinery.org, was down this way on other business and decided he wanted to stop by the shop, help me out with a few of the other little projects that I got going on around here. So I want to share a little bit of that visit with you. I really enjoyed it. He is a super nice guy. I also got into a few other little things this week, but very little. Uh, my time this week was very limited. So thanks for watching, guys, and I hope you enjoy. So here's the blade cutter on this machine. Come factory, so it's 68 years old. It probably cut thousands and thousands of blades, hardened steel blades, and it's extremely dull. You really got to crank on this thing to get it to somewhat tear a blade into. So let's pull it off of here and uh, take it over to the bench and see what it's going to take for us to uh, freshen this thing up, if it's even possible. It could be past the point of no return. So here's a look at the blade cutter, a little closer look. It has a blade on top, two blades on the bottom. The blade on top goes down, it goes in between the two on the bottom. Just uses a cam to move that blade. And it's broken here. It's got should have two of these ears, one on this side. Now I've already went through the trouble and made a replacement. What I pretty much want to do is sharpen the blades on this and clean it up and get it working right again and make a new uh, a new handle for it. So let's let's tear it down, get a better look at it, see just how bad these blades are because they're not in good shape. And if we can or maybe can't uh, sharpen these. So these do old bandsaws that come with a blade welder. I've never seen one that didn't come with a blade shear as well, although they're probably out there. But that's basically a one-stop shop. Imagine your milling machine coming with a small cutter grinder attached to it. That's basically the idea here. They really have done a great thing when they put blade welder, blade shear, all the stuff that you need, even a grinder on these machines. So, And they really... Really had it uh, had it figured out on these old saws. Don't have a set of snapping pliers there. No. Don't have a set of snapping pliers. They're that small. Time. So for the last few hours, I've left all the parts other than the blades of that uh, shear inside of this tank with the pump running and it's circulating. Now this is Zep, uh, purple degreaser is what I use in here. And the stuff is uh, pretty dirty. It's about due for a change, but it works extremely well. In fact, it works so well that if you're not careful, it will pull off the paint. Now I left these in there for this reason on purpose, but uh, you get the idea that's some pretty good stuff.
Who is that? Oh, well. It's Pippi, the green cheek Connor. The shop parrot now? So here I've got my Rockwell hardness tester and just because I'm curious, I want to see how hard the blades are that come out of that blade cutter and that, uh, on that bandsaw. So we're going to put them in here and see, I'm sure they're on the C scale, and see just how hard they actually are. We'll start with the main central cutter. So I've stoned this blade off. I want it to sit really flat on the anvil. And we'll set it on there and raise. Uh, the part up into the penetrator. We'll make one full loop on the indicator. Basically we have a little side needle here. We want to bring that into the black dot. And then I'm going to zero the indicator. i got a little ring down here I can twist to zero the bezel. Then there's a button or a little place that you press here to start everything in motion. And this is not the reading. we have got to let this needle settle and then reset this handle down here and then that should give us the hardness of this part. Alright, so I'm going to flip this handle and that should tell us how hard it is. So it is 58.25 Rockwell C. Really you'd do three tests and average them, but one's good enough for for what we're doing. So I'm going to test the other two as well to see how hard they are as well, you know, as well in comparison to this one, I guess. So we let that needle settle a bit and then pull this one handle down here and that will give us the hardness. That one says it's 60. Not peppy. Mm -hmm. This is the bird that can sometimes be heard uh, when I'm editing, when I'm doing voiceovers. You hear a loud squawking. <laughs> <laughs> it's this guy right here. Guy or a girl? We yeah, don't could, know. could be, could be a girl. So here's a look at all the blades. Here's the main central blade and you know all this does is come down between these two and really it's supposed to shear the blade but in this condition it's just kind of crunching it into breaking it. Because we have a radius on this edge, this is the cutting edge, and really we want this to be a sharp 90 degree. But we're rolled over pretty good right here. Now we'll do what we can to get the majority of that out but we we're not going to be able to get it all out, I don't think. This will work much better when we're done, but it's still not going to be in perfect condition. Really, these are so bad that they need replaced. All these edges are rolled over pretty hard. So we'll see what we can do. I'm sure it'll work better than it did. So, grinding vise is down on the grinder. We're going to put a parallel in there, and I'm going to grind both of the uh, side blades at the same time. So I'm just going to Back those up against each other. I already stoned them off really good, so they should set in here good and square. I'll just push them down a bit. That should be good. Yep, OK. 
Okay. Wheels already dressed. So all we gotta do is clean these up a bit. We'll take as little off as possible. So I'm gonna pull off about 20 thousandths. At least that's the goal after touch off. So because the parts that we're grinding are actually narrower than the wheel is wide, no reason to traverse across this thing. The only thing I'm doing is feeding the grinding head down into the part until I hit the numbers that I want. I'm calling it good. And this is about as simple of a part to grind as there is. Alright, let's see what that looks like. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Alright, good enough on these. So on this main blade, the cutting edge and the back of it is not parallel. So that's what I'm doing right now is using an indicator off the actual cutting edge, moving the table back and forth just to make sure that I grind on the exist this on the existing angle that it is in relationship to the back of it anyway. So I'm within a couple thousandths because it varies a bit, so that's good enough. These aren't super precision parts. So grinding the center blade is exactly the same as grinding the uh, other two side blades. What I'm trying to avoid is grinding away too much. That way, if I did, these shears wouldn't close all the way and then I'd end up with a blade cutter that just doesn't work. So there's not a lot of excess material here to, to remove, so I just have to be really careful. Dust them as good as I can get them and call that good enough or else I'll be in trouble. I don't know. It's better than it was. So I think we're about ready to go back together. All cleaned up. I'm going to put a little bit of light oil on these because we ran them through that degreasing tank and they'll rust otherwise. I'm not going to paint them. They're not painted originally on, the, on any of the saws I've ever seen. Blades turned out really good. There's not a lot of meat left though. If we ever had to grind them again, we'd have to just dust them. So we'll keep them sharp and then uh, we won't have any trouble. When you let them continue to wear and continue to wear and roll over them edges is when you get problems. So this also needs to be really straight because this is what holds those blades. And if it's bent any bit, or if the bolts are loose that hold these two frames together, it allows these blades to separate a bit and it more tears the blade that you're cutting in two instead of shearing it. So you need to make sure that this fits together properly and then we shouldn't have any problems with it. Should work the way that the way that it should. So let's uh, check these, make sure they're not bent, and start putting this thing back together. So I'm just checking these shear frames with a with a straight edge, basically a rule, just to make sure that they're not bent. Because if they were, I'd want to straighten those up. That way, I make sure that these blades are held square to each other or parallel with each other, and they come together nicely. Otherwise, the shear wouldn't work very well. And I believe these frames are blued. Now, none of the saws that I've ever seen with these on them had the shears painted from the factory, so I'm not painting these. And, you know, I'm just wiping them down with a little oil to help keep them from rusting. But, to be honest, ever since I've got this shop together and sealed up and been running this dehumidifier, I haven't dealt with any rust. And before that, before the shop was done, you know, I had to walk around every week 
wipe every metal surface down, and it was still a losing battle. Everything rusted, moisture in my toolboxes, mold, and on and on and on. And closing this shop up, best thing I ever did. Hum dehumidifier, second. So if you got m moisture issues in your shop, man, pick up a dehumidifier. They they work. <laughs> New handle, ordered that knob, and made the uh, the rods just a piece of O1. Just mimicked its length after the original. Just measured the one work. And there we go. Let's try it out. Let's see if it works. Don't see why it wouldn't, but I want to see if it works. So who in the right mind gets excited about trying out a bandsaw blade shear? I do, if you would consider me in my right mind, that is. I guess I just get excited about fixing stuff and it working the way that it should instead of, you know, having to struggle with everything all the time because that's what you do if stuff doesn't work well. So let's try it out. Half inch wide, uh, 25 thousandths thick. This is a piece of bimetal blade. It's what I'm going to be using in this for the majority of stuff. So let's try it and see how it works. I know before it cut like crap. So cut okay at the back of the blade where I have all the leverage, but at the front it didn't do any good. So let's try it. I am excited for this really. All right, so all the way out at the front of the blade, sorry for the horrible shot, but this filing cabinet is in my way. So pretty good, a lot better than what it was before. It's not super easy. At the back of the blade, it should be, yeah, it's like butter at the back of the blade. But that makes sense because it's got so much leverage back there. But at the front, where you should cut your blades anyway, because that's what these ears are for, are to make sure that your blade is pushed up good and square. That way when you weld it back together, you know, it's just, it's already square. So try it again. Yeah, a little effort, but light years better than what it was before. So I would consider that a success. So I've got a very special visitor in the shop this week. I'm extremely excited. This is Keith Rucker from Vintage Machinery from the YouTube channel, Vintage Machinery. He's down here. Uh, what are you you're bringing? A piece of equipment to, to work with Brian, right? Yeah, so I've actually got a, a clutch off of a 50 horsepower steam traction engine, a case wow. traction yeah. engine. This is for the Florida Flywheelers group down in Florida. And uh, they wanted me to bore it out. It has some wear in it, bore it out and put some bushings in it. And it's just too big to swing on any of my lathes. I needed a lathe that would swing like 30 inches. And who has that? Yeah. Brian Block. Yeah, Brian Block has so, that. Uh, I've talked to Brian and he's like, yeah, bring it on up. So I'm actually scheduled. He's working today. This is on a Saturday, and, but he's off on Sunday. So I'm going to go by his place tomorrow. But Brian only lives, what, about 20, 30 minutes from here? Yeah, yeah, if, if that, yeah, yeah about so, 20 minutes. And I've been up to Brian's shop two or three times. 
Yeah, never he's a, he's never a great met guy. that. Well, I have met Steve yeah. before. Never been to a shop before, so I said, you know what, I'm going to swing by and yeah. check him out and whatever. So here I am. I appreciate it. And we I got some it. things we're going to play around with today, right? Yep. And work on the surface plate and uh, check these Gibbs out. Yeah. So you guys know he's been restoring that do all. Big uh, do all milling machine. Milling machine, and and uh, he's going to tap into some of my experience with machinery building. I'm not an expert, but. I guess I know more than He's most more, people. <laughs> more of an expert than I am, so I'm glad to have him. Yeah, so anyway, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. So we're over here at the surface plate, and Steve has a really nice pink Starrett. Mm -hmm. And you said you've had this it, it calibrated? Would, it and... was redone by Starrett uh, in okay. June. Okay, so you had it sent off, and they lapped it yep. and recertified it. And what grade is it? I believe it's an A. An A, okay. A is plenty sufficient, and... I tell you a lot of times when people do these surface plates, if you tell them you want an A, they're gonna they're gonna certify it as an A, but it could be a double A. But yeah. usually, if you want the double A certification, you have to pay more for yeah. it. I know when I had my surface plate done one time, it graded a double A, but I'm like, eh. the guy told me it's like, you know, I can put a double A sticker on there, but you don't need a double A yeah. sticker, so let me just put an A sticker on there, and it'll be a lot cheaper. Yep. So I, I don't know what it, but. Double A is fine on yeah. this. But before we start using this, the first thing, anytime you use a service plate, you need to get it good and clean. You got to remember that we're making measurements off of this that are in the sub tenths of a thousandth of an inch. So even a little bit of dust on this thing can make a difference. So I typically just use Windex. So let's, uh, let's get everything off of it and get it cleaned up a little bit. So typically, the first thing I'm going to do is just take my hand and you can feel the stuff and it don't take long i mean i'm not being critical here at all right i mean you just you have to do this throughout the day to get this thing clean oh yeah and i mean at 20 minutes from now there's just going to be dust particles settle on this thing and you don't realize how important that is but you know so anyway i've kind of wiped it clean you can feel it with your hand really well and we'll come in here and just use this windex there's all kinds of stuff you can use to clean surface plates with. Uh, Sterrett makes a surface plate cleaner. Um, I think uh, Standridge has a really nice surface plate cleaner that has like a lanolin stuff in there. It really does a good job. But yeah, I've never, I've never used that. I've only used, uh, used Windex. But Windex also does a good job. Yep. It's not super dirty. You can see some stuff we're pulling off of there. But I just can't emphasize how important it is to do this every time you use your surface plate. And even if you're using it a lot throughout the day, to stop and clean your surface plate yeah. well, throughout the day. And also will keep down the wear on the plate as mm -hmm. well. That's right. Especially All if you're dragging tools dust around. Dust is abrasive. And usually it, they'll, once you get it kind of wiped clean, it just takes a second or two and it just evaporates off. So this is the, the gib on the table, right? The, yes, the that's long. the table gib. And if, if you're not familiar with a gib, this is what's used to adjust the, 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 the dovetails on it. It makes, adjusts the tightness in those. And if you look, this is tapered. It's thin on one end, it's, it's wide on the other. And your, your, your dovetail is machined to match this taper on one side. And basically, you just slide this thing in and out, and you can tighten it up so that as the machine wears, you can keep it where your table's not slopping side to side. So it is tapered, but both sides of this should be a nice flat plane. Now, this side over here, this is the side that basically just... Actually, no, this is this, the... Okay, I'm sitting here looking at it. This is the side that's got the oil grooves in it. So this is the side that's actually rubbing up against the, uh, the, the table. table. And you can see the wear marks in it. The other side has been scraped, but this has just been scraped flat. So you just basically got two planes here. And when you are, are doing this, what you'll do is when you get your table back is you'll actually scrape this side to match it. So mm -hmm. to make sure the tapers are just right. But this side has been scraped. So we want to make sure that it is it is flat. And the way you can do that is through a process called hinging. And if you sit here and just lay on the surface plate and you grab one in and move it, 
Notice it's pivoting right here and it's pivoting right here. So what that tells me is, is that this part is bowed. Yes. It's high in the middle. We could probably get some feeler gauges mm -hmm. and slide up underneath here if we wanted to. And if we flip it over to the other side, you would expect it to be the exact opposite. It's going to be high and it's going to be... Yeah, it's going to be low on these yeah, ends, it's going to be high, low, in the high in the center. So it's probably going to pivot, look, right there in mm -hmm. the middle. So if you've got good contact from one or the other, it's going to pivot about one third in from each side. So somewhere right along in here is where it should be pivoting if this thing is perfectly flat. So that's just a really quick thing you can do to, to see how flat something is. So have you got some feeler gauges? I do. Let's, uh, let's, let's see how far out we are. All right, so I just found the thinnest one he has. This is one and a half thousandths thick. And what we're going to do is just see if we can slide it up underneath there. And we can right in there. See there? About right in there it starts touching again. All the way out. Tell you what, let's flip it over the other way. So, yeah. And it starts touching about there. And about there. So let's go to something thicker. There's four thousandths. So, yeah. We got a pretty good bow in there. So there's seven thousandths. Here. That one's nine thousandths. And pretty substantial bow. Yeah, it's actually more than I thought it was. Let's uh I, know, I guess there's to. a few things. Uh, who knows, Q, it's just a random set. Um a few things that can cause these to bow. What would you call, think the main, just over time, the cast yeah. iron creeping or so the adjustments and the pressure on them? The, the biggest thing is, is that um, the way these things are adjusted and what have you, a lot of times you'll get pressure on one side or the other and it will just, it'll just bend over time. Yeah, especially if you, I guess, if you have both screws tight mm -hmm. against each other and it bows out the center yeah, maybe. and a lot of times too, if you have shims behind it, sometimes they'll put shims behind these if you're, if it starts getting worn and a lot of times they put shims on either end, so that allows it to not wear evenly. Uh, but ideally you wanna have good contact on both sides. Yeah, we got 10,000, so that's, that's, I guess I could double some up, but I'm not gonna take them apart. The main thing is, is we see we've got a good bit to go. So how do we get that out? There's a couple of things you could do. We could just start, scraping on this thing and, you know, cut 10 thousandths off of the mm -hmm. ends. But, um, you know, this thing is bent. That's the reason that it's like this. So I think what we're going to try to do is before we do any scraping, we're going to try to just bend it back yeah. into shape as close as we can. We're not going to get it perfect, but, you know, hopefully we can get it within a thou or two. Mm -hmm. Because with hand scraping, you know, the more you have to take off, the more work you have yeah. to do. It's, it's, all, it's a... You know, typically we want to try to get something when you're hand scraping to be within, where you're not having to remove more than about three or four thousandths. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the rule of thumb. If you have to uh, scrape off more than three or four thousandths, you're probably better off machining it. Machining it, it. yeah. Yeah. That so makes sense. Let's, uh, let's see if we can set up and, and uh, bend this a little bit. So we got the gib in here, and just, just to kind of let folks know, this gib is made out of cast iron. And I know some people say, well, you know, you can't bend cast iron, it'll break. Cast iron will break, but it will bend a lot more than people give it credit for. Uh, it's actually a very flexible material, a lot more flexible than people think it is. We've only, you know, I'm going to start with, you know, we, we know we've got to go at least 10 thousandths. Now, what you got to remember is when you bend this, it's going to spring back. So, you know, we can kind of look on here. I'm, I'm going to try to get it when it springs back to go to 10 thousandths because that was the last one I measured. I know it's probably more than that, but we're going to sneak up on this thing. Yeah. So, I'm gonna probably go to 20 thousandths. I'm just using a C-clamp here. I've got it jacked up on the ends. We know that it's, it's loose somewhere to about the middle. I'm gonna probably just go about that far. And let's go back, back off now. And, yeah. okay, we actually, I'm not uh, sure. If yeah, we, 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 the C-clamp was pushing down on one okay. of zero. Go ahead and re-zero it right there. We got plenty to take out of this thing. All right, so I'm gonna, whoops, 
of too far back. We're going to bend it a pretty good bit here and then back it back out. And so that moved it a few thou right there. It moved it about almost five thou. But we're going to keep on going here and bend it some more. And it looks like we've done about 15 thou on there. So yeah. let's take it back to the surface plate and see where we're at. And it's just a rinse and repeat operation until you get it where you want it. Great. We'll take that, uh, that's a nine thousandths. And it's touching oh, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We moved it, yeah. So I can't get it all the way through there. It's coming through the front, which this thing's sitting a little bit crooked. But so let's go down. Let's see. Here's our one and a half thou. Okay, it's still in there good. Let's go somewhere about halfway in between. Here's a three thou. It slides under there, but I can actually feel it, some tension on it. So we haven't got far to go. Let me see where that right there. Flex it down, come back off. And we've gone about five pounds. So let's see what it looks like now. Alright, so it's still pivoting on the end, but I can actually tell it's, it's moved down just a little bit from where it was before. But we are probably close enough now that we're just going to have to start scraping. You know, I can feel that tension in there with that 5,000. Let's go down to something. Kind of rough. Three thou. Still tight. There it is. So I can get that thou and a half up underneath it, but barely. I go to, I don't see a two in here. But I do have a three. That one there. That's not the three. I saw it a minute ago. That's the three right there. And the three is touching. So we're probably where we need to be. So let's um, let's start scraping it. Yeah, so we're just putting some spot and ink on here and we're going to blue it up. I'll show you my engine we got right now. It's not perfect, but I think we're to the point where we need to start paying a little bit closer attention to what we're doing. So if you look now, engine roughly right, right here, which is not quite a third in. I think a third would be somewhere right along in there and about the same on this side. So we're getting close. The feeler gauge, you know, in places you can still get it in there, in places you can't. But we're going to take it over here now. We'll drop our part down on here and blew it up. And I'm sitting here just looking. But the ends are obviously still high because I can actually see the marks on there. But it's going to transfer over. Which by marks, you, you're seeing it in I'm the ink. I'm seeing it in the ink. Yeah, you yep. can see it in Where it's rubbing the ink. the ink on the plate. But you can actually see a little mark there. So we're making some contact that's heavier there, get a little bit lighter there. That matches our hinge points. Uh, so anyway, we'll just uh, flip this over now. And there you go. You can see exactly what's high on here. So we got, it looks like some really high points on the very end. We got some high points there, high point on the very end. And we're actually making some contact in the center. And we're still from a scraping standpoint, got a pretty good ways to go here, but we're starting to get contact. So we got just a couple points on the end here that are high, a little bit of blue right here. We actually got some contact in the center. 
eh, tiny about here. But then we got two real high points on the end. So we'll knock those high points down. And I'm uh, probably just not even going to do anything about the middle right now. I'm just going to hit these high points on the end and bring it back over for another round. So for those that don't know, the tool that Keith is using right now is called a power scraper. And it works very similar to a reciprocating saw or a sawzall. Except for this tool, I like to think of it as micro-machining. Each little scrape that Keith does with this tool pulls off anywhere from two to five tenths of a thousandth of an inch. So although it may look like something you'd see used in a butcher shop, if you use it in the proper manner, in sequence, constantly checking your work, you can get extremely accurate uh, parts with using this method. So, after probably four four cycles, four or five, yeah, uh, getting a lot more contact, and it's uh, it's coming in, it's starting to look pretty good. Yeah. So you know, what I'm excited to see is every time we do it, we're getting more blue marks out here in the areas that I haven't scraped. I've kind of scraped this area, kind of this area in the middle, and probably out to about here. But it's like this is virgin area, at least for us. You know, we haven't had any marks in there, so that tells me we're we're making progress. Mm -hmm. It's getting flatter and flatter. And this is the first time. I mean, we're I'm still in roughing mode right now, but I'm starting to get fairly even contact points all the way across this. We're nowhere close to where we want to be at, but uh, I guarantee you that this right now is probably better than most gives and most machines. Yeah, uh, we've made a huge improvement to it, but we're gonna we're gonna make it better. So let's go at it. We're just going to continue on here. So this job is extremely repetitive. After every cycle, we clean the part up, take it back to the surface plate, we rub it on the blued section of the surface plate. Any ink that transfers from the plate to the part, we know that at that point our part is touching, and our plate is our master. It is the flattest thing in the shop. So if we match this part, to the plate we know that it will be flat or that it's much flatter than it was to begin with because it had a substantial bow in it but you get the idea it's a very repetitive back and forth and if you keep it up and use the right technique you'll end up with an extremely flat part to, to get to try to get it any better than what it is now would just be wasted effort really as it is a static surface just Mm -hmm. Nice. So it's a lot better than it was because it was way out. And on a give, you know, again, right now, all we're trying to do is make this surface flat. You'll scrape. I was going to say we, but you're, you'll yeah. scrape. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll scrape the 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 other side into the part once we get it there. Mm -hmm. so you've got a nice flat surface there to to work off of on that back side. Looks good. I we're appreciate done. the help. That was that's no, awesome. Fun little project. Yeah. Fun little project. So the mail just ran and I received a couple really nice viewer gifts that I definitely appreciate for the do-all saw. One will complete the look and I guess the function of it as well. And the other one's pretty much awesome spare parts. So let me show you what was sent. I really appreciate it. So a lot of you know if you've watched my previous videos that when I got my big do-all saw, it was missing the speed chart. It actually blew off when my buddy Al was uh, hauling this thing. And Joe Maloney, a viewer of the channel, heard my call basically for one of these charts and uh, contacted me, said he had an old saw that he wasn't fixing and he'd be glad to send this chart in to basically complete mine, at least let this chart live on on another saw. So I appreciate it. This thing's awesome. Not only does it complete the look of the saw, but it's also a great tool to have for setting your speeds, saw speeds, saw type, there's a ton of useful information on this thing. Uh, let me show it to you a little closer, and then I will clean it up and put it on the saw, actually. And I want to show you the other parts that were sent in to the channel as well. Parts for the do-all saw. So these charts are really a crucial part to the saw. They'll tell you how fast to run your blade, what type of blade to run, depending on the thickness of material. Should you run flood coolant? Should you run mist coolant or no coolant at all? It gives different speeds for different materials on and on and on it's an extremely useful chart and a great tool to have with the saw that's really why they went through all the trouble to make such an elaborate chart 
for those saws is because they were a great tool to have. And they're not easy to find used, right? You don't want really the saw without the chart, if they come with it, that is. So thank you, Joe. I appreciate this more than you know. I'm going to clean this thing up and put it at its new home on my saw. Elizabeth's over here comparing... <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth's over here comparing charts because they made a bunch of different variations and she's just scrolling the internet seeing what differences there are. Cause they did... They did make quite a few. The one at work is a little different than this, more a little more modern, but basically the same infos on all of them. So the next items that were sent in are from Robert Kirkpatrick, and that is two sets of blade guides for the do-all that are a little more modern than the ones that are on mine now and have some of the parts that mine are actually missing. So thank you, Robert. I appreciate these. I'll definitely use them. I'll probably just completely rebuild these while I'm using this saw and then swap them out. That's what I think I'll do. And work out a, maybe a couple different coolant systems for, for different guides. I don't know. We'll see. But those are nice to have, so thank you. They were sitting on his shelf unused. He didn't have the saw, I guess. And uh, they weren't doing him any good. So thank you. I appreciate that. So if you have one of these do-all saws with a chart similar to this, do me a favor and look on your chart and see if it has meteorites in... Uh, in the selection of materials as far as for sawing. This one has petrified wood, meteorites, fire brick, limestone in the diamond sawing section. It may be on yours in the abrasive or friction, who knows. But look and see if you have meteorites on your chart. Ours at work has meteorite on it as well. So this really does complete the look of the saw. Not only is it useful, this is probably the most used piece of the chart that I'll, I'll be referring to. And that just gives, it's a contouring section, and that just gives your basic grades of steel, suggestions on you know, your speeds and feeds. This chart also gives your maximum radius that you can cut given a band's uh, thickness or width. And uh, right now we're on, this does not have 4140 on it. It has 4130. Uh, let's say 4137, we wanted to cut that grade of steel. And our piece is an inch thick. So it recommends we use a mist coolant. It recommends heavy cutting pressure. What that is, I'm not for sure, but it recommends heavy. It's saying we should use a six tooth per inch blade, which a precision blade. This is based on carbon steel blade, right? This is not, uh, not bimetal. And then it's saying we should run our blade at about 50 surface feet per minute. And we should expect 0.65 inch travel on our feed. So pretty neat. I'm glad to add this, man. That's nice. All right, guys, that's it this week. Huge thanks to Keith Rucker from VintageMachinery.org for stopping by the shop. I am very glad to add his name to the list of guys who've... Uh, stopped by and paid the shop a visit. I don't want to forget Brian Block, Lance Baltzy, Adam Booth. All those guys have stopped by to give me a hand uh, with scraping, either power or just hand scraping. And it's pretty intimidating to go at your precision surfaces with a scraper, right? You wouldn't think that that's the way that it's done, but you know, it is, and you can get extremely, extremely accurate parts doing things that way. So it won't be long before the parts for the do-all mill will be back from grinding, and they will require some hand scraping to get them to get them back fit together as good as they can anyway. So I got to look forward to doing that. So a bit intimidating, but it'll work out, I'm sure. So huge thanks to Robert Kirkpatrick for the guides and Joe Maloney on the do-all bandsaw chart. Man, those are amazing gifts. And I can't say thanks enough. The YouTube machinist community is absolutely amazing. And I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be where I'm at. And I wouldn't be able to hopefully go where I'm going without your guys' support. So much appreciated. So that's it. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, you guys are amazing. And I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes. Hold on to your dream Oh, I know you wanna scream 
since the day.